appreciate you so much. I'd like to say we also appreciate Robert and Lee for all their work that they do keeping the place so clean. Not just clean, but sanitized. COVID don't have a chance to come here. Not even on the floor. We also want to thank uh, Arnold and Frank's not here today, but Arnold and Frank for such a good job with the coffee. I know that I'm not a coffee drinker, but I know most everybody else in here is, and I know that they appreciate having the coffee. And, uh, and Mike, for taking care of all the sound. Uh, get here before anybody else gets here to turn on the cooler in the summer and the heat in the winter. Well, so where is the heat? <laughs> what? I said, where is the heat? <laughs> <laughs> she said, where is the heat as she put her sweatshirt on? <laughs> it's here. You're just cold. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, just, I just thank the Lord for all of you who sing the wall with the songs that I play. Your ministry to the whole world by means of what I do to. So you're involved in the ministry just as much as any one of us. Amen. And I thank, thank you, God Paul. for every one of you. Thank you. Awesome. I know there's somebody else that makes things but I probably forgot by now. So forgive me. Forgive me. Next time. The worship team for sure. I already thank you. I thank you ever so mm -hmm. <coughs> Next time. Maybe next time I'll remember. Okay. Old age. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and I didn't even pick up on who said that. I don't know. I'm thinking it was Dennis. We all did. Janet, was that Robert that said that? No, Jeanette, no, I know, I know, I, I know you would tell me the truth. <laughs> Jeanette, Jeanette would have lied to me. That's right. That's right. Okay. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians again today. Working our way through this book. 1 and 2 Thessalonians are both uh, books that are high on the list of all the things that are in Scripture concerning uh, the return of Jesus. Uh, and particularly the, the aspect of the return of Jesus that's the rapture that we're all looking forward to. So this, uh, uh, these are two good books to study uh, in the time that we live in. So we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 through 20 today. So if you want to turn to 1 Thessalonians 2, 17, you can be ready to follow along with me. And uh, if you're not following in your Bible, uh, you can follow on the screen. Mike will have it up there. 1 Thessalonians 2, 17. <clears throat> For uh, my acknowledgement and your awareness, I'll be using the New American Standard, the Revised Standard, and the New Living Translation. I'll be using the Interlinear Greek English New Testament and the Analytical Greek Lexicon. And today I'll be referring to some material from Morris, Hobbes, and Hotch. So with that acknowledgement, let's begin with verse 17. And we all know that this is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so these are God's words. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. Paul begins this verse with, but we. And this takes us back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. And we see clearly there that the we is, of course, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. When he speaks here to brethren, of course, we know he's speaking to the Christians in Thessalonica. Now the next phrase is translated different in various translations. 
the new American standard renders it having been taken away from you. New Living Translation says after we were separated from you. Now the Revised Standard has an interesting one and you'll see how uh, much closer it is to the literal Greek as I share that with you in a minute. Uh, it renders but since we're, we were bereft of you. Since we were bereft of you. Now literally in the Greek it reads being bereaved from you. So it's a very strong word he's using here concerning his separation uh, from the people in Thessalonica. Being bereaved from you. Uh, it is the, this is the only place that this Greek word is used in the New Testament. And it's expressing uh, uh, most often uh, the meaning of orphan is the way that the word would most often be used. Uh, but even though uh, it's used as or orphan most often, it can be used as other meanings other than pertaining to being an orphan. And what it shows here is the strong uh, word that it is uh, that shows Paul's desolation. And that's a strong word. His desolation due to his separation from those he loved in Thessalonica. So you see this, this strong love that Paul has here and this this heartbreak to the point of using a word that's making him feel orphaned because he has been separated uh, from the people in Thessalonica and so those are very strong words that you see in the Greek that you don't see uh, the strength of in, uh, in, in the uh, English un unless maybe uh, the uh, RSV gets pretty close when it said we were bereft of you. So thus far in this chapter, Paul has been uh, comparing himself to a nursing mother as he describes his connection with the people there. He has been comparing himself to a father. And now he's comparing himself to being and feeling like an orphan as he has been separated from them. So again, we, we point out the fact that the deep love and affection that he has uh, for them as he writes this letter. Now, Paul defines the period of time that he was gone in uh, three different translations. One says, uh, separated from them uh, as a short while. And then another says, separated a short time. And then one says, short, uh, separated a little while. So we see that he was only separated from them a short time. There's a very short period of time between the writing of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Okay? And so he'd only been separated from them for a short period of time, but yet he's, he's, he's moved in this deep uh, way to this point of desolation and feeling orphaned from them, even though he's only been gone from them for a short time. Uh, it's just a powerful uh, expression that he's making here of, uh, of his love and, and concern for these people. Now, it gets really interesting here. He assures them that his separation had been in personal presence, but not in heart. Now, this word in the Greek that's translated person or personal presence uh, literally means face. Okay? Face. Face. Uh, thus he is saying that they did not see his face but they had his heart of love they were not seeing his face but they had his heart of love now Paul's feelings of longing for them are expressed here in three Greek words one is translated as endeavored now this combines the idea of speed and diligence and it conveys an expression of eagerness and, and most translations use that word uh, eagerness. It refers to making a quick and serious effort. Okay? So you probably have something along the line of eagerness in your translation. The second word is uh, translated as more abundantly. And the third is translated in the form of a phrase with uh, much desire. So these are all words then that are describing and referring to his desire uh, 
and his, his uh, brokenness from being separated from these people. Now, literally in the Greek, uh, it says, uh, what's translated his desire is, is literally the face of you to see. The face of you to see is what he's talking about here. The way we translate that is that he desires to see them face to face. Okay? The face of you to see, he's desiring to see them face to face. Thus Paul is saying that he and his fellow workers were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. The New Living Translation says it uh, this way. It gets the same message across, but it doesn't use the words as close uh, it, as uh, the words that are in the Greek. It says, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. And so the same message is there, but as I said, it's uh, not hardly as, as, as close in terms of some of the words using face and and, and eagerness and desire and, and things of that nature. Uh, I remember uh, when I was in the Navy and had to go out to sea several months at a time. Uh, I can identify with this because I desired eagerly to see Belita face to face again. And uh, that's what Paul is saying here. Uh, this, this, this eager desire to see them again. Now, Paul's great love for, for and his desire to be with the believers in Thessalonica should inspire us to have a greater desire to spend time together. Uh, when we look at the long list of activities that I announced earlier, and we look at our two uh, scheduled events in which we have opportunity to come together uh, uh, each week, then it actually makes me feel good about the structure that our church has uh, and the activities that we have at this time because we're giving opportunity for us to be together uh, in, in various ways. And, uh, and so this should be a desire that we would have as Christians. Uh, I think we have a good balance. We're not, we're not just uh, running you to death with uh, church events, and, and I think some churches do that, uh, but we're having enough things offered that if you desire to be here and have more time to spend with the people uh, of the church, then the church is providing uh, those uh, avenues and opportunities. And, and so I feel like that we are being faithful uh, in that manner. Uh, and giving a way for us to express our affection and our love for each other. And, uh, and I know that when, uh, you know, some of us leave to go on vacation or, or something takes you out of town or whatever happens, you're sick or whatever, I, I know that we miss each other. And, uh, and it's good to come back together uh, again. And I'm thankful for that, that we have that type of a, of a relationship one with another uh, in the church and uh, it's what we should have <clears throat> now verse 18 he says for we wanted to see you I Paul more than once and yet Satan hindered us Paul begins this verse with wherefore we wish to come to you uh, he's expressing his desire uh, held by himself, Paul and Savannah, uh, uh, Timothy and Savannah, to come and see them again. Now, then he turns it totally personal. He says, uh, but I, Paul, okay, now he's talking about himself. The phrase that follows is very interesting because in the Greek it says both once and twice. <laughs> but I, Paul, both once and twice. Now, we're translating that and it denotes that he wanted to see them more than once. Both once and twice, more than once. <clears throat> so even though in the Greek sometimes you can find the definition of the word, you know an English definition, and but many times it's more than a one word meaning as it is in English. And if you notice, as often as I speak about 
uh, things in the Greek, you notice that it's out of order. It, it's pretty much always out of the order that we speak. And, uh, and like this, sometimes it's in a situation where uh, you look at it and you say, oh my goodness, what does that mean both once and twice? You know? But then you think about it, also, it does make sense to be uh, talking about more than once. But there, there's, there's some strange things sometimes when you try to uh, look at it in another language and bring it into, into English. Now, Paul then is expressing the fact that he desired to come to the Thessalonica believers more than once, or as one translation says, again and again. <clears throat> so he missed them. He, he was bereft of them, <laughs> if you want to use that word. Uh, and he was sad to be away from them. He wanted to come to see them. But notice what he says next. Then he says, and Satan hindered us. The Greek word translated hindered means in the Greek cut in or to strike in. Hence to uh, impede, to interrupt, or to hinder as in the translation that I read from. Now this verb is used for the cutting into a road to make it impassable. I don't know how they did it in the day that they were speaking the Greek and writing this, but we can imagine a big bulldozer or something, you know, just cutting across the road and just taking a big swath of it out, and it would make it impassable. That's the, the meaning of this word here. <clears throat> so, he's saying then that Satan cut into Paul's plans to return to Thessalonica and stopped him from going. Some would say that this is really referring to demons and not Satan. But the word that is used here is the same word that Jesus uses twice in his temptation uh, uh, in the, in, uh, after his baptism when he went into the wilderness for the 40 days. And it's translated there as Satan. Now I've just got a, a hunch that it's Satan, not demons. Okay? So I'm going to go with Satan here and not demons because I believe that's what it says. I believe that's what it means. And even more when you look at who was dealing with Jesus. Now, you and I may not get tempted by Satan himself. Okay? We're most likely are tempted by demons or whatever happens that comes from the enemy. It's through demons to us. But to Jesus, it was Satan. And I believe to Paul, it was Satan. Okay? Because they're a little bit higher on the list than we are. Okay? We may not be worthy of a visit from him. But uh, thankfully, we're not. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. And that just struck me how thankful I am of that, okay? I don't want to give him any ideas. I've had enough from his, from his workers, the low-level workers, uh, that, that I don't want any more of that. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. Now what I want us to realize in this is the reality and the power of Satan that is revealed here. He's real. And he cut into Paul's plans. And he stopped Paul from going where he wanted to go. He wanted to go back to Thessalonica sooner than he did. Okay? He's powerful and he cut into Paul's plans to go to Thessalonica. He's, he's, he's not only real, but he's powerful and was able to cut into his plans and stop him. Okay? Now that's something we need to recognize. I, I didn't understand it. Uh, I remember, I don't remember much of what I heard in church as a young person. Uh, I really don't. <laughs> I don't know why. I, 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 that's just blank to me for the most part. For the most part it is. Uh, but I remember hearing back when I was much younger a preacher preached a sermon 
about the devil being real. And, and I thought that was funny. Because I guess I realized enough that I thought the devil was real and he didn't need to preach that sermon. But it was it was like it struck me like, hey, here this guy's just got new information. <laughs> so I'm thinking that there must have been a movement along that time in which people were thinking the devil wasn't really real. That he wasn't a real person, you know, that that, that he wasn't really real. But for some reason, I guess. God brought that back to my mind uh, at one point to, to think that there, there must have really been a time in which people who called themselves Christians and attended church really doubted the reality of, of the devil. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I, I have not doubted the reality of the devil and his demons a day, well, even before that, but for sure since I was 16 and surrendered to the call to preach. Uh, it was like <clears throat> a door was open and they said, sicky, <laughs> if you know what I mean by that word. It got serious when that happened in my life at 16 years old. Now, I, I, I said, as I said before, I don't think I've ever encountered the devil, uh, Satan himself. But I certainly have encountered most of his demons. And, um, and two of the most, no, I can't say the most, two, two of the more powerful uh, encounters, and I've shared this with some of you before, that I, I have had with uh, the, the devil's workers was one night in, in literally audibly hearing a demon laugh in the most hideous, horrible sound that you can imagine. I literally heard it. But in my head, I heard it for real, for real, just like I would hear you speak a word. And uh, in that same event, I also was present when an adult man was thrown physically across the room by the Spirit. I had a couple of encounters that would come up to me personally uh, as, as ranking in that way that I will not uh, mention now. But those, those really happened. Okay? And I'm trying to translate to you from my personal experience. The devil is real. Amen. And the devil is powerful. His demons are real and they are powerful. So, we realize that from this scripture. And he's always seeking to interrupt the work of the Spirit of God in and through our lives. He's always working to sidetrack us to do something some way. Now, with all of that said, Let's put something that is extremely important above that. And that is this. The devil and his demons are real and powerful and they work to hinder us in every way they can. But we've got to remember that for <coughs> us as believers, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That's right. Yeah. How powerful they are, no matter how much they try to impede and interrupt and hinder and sidetrack us and tempt us, greater is the Spirit of God who lives in every believer than the devil himself and all of his demons that are out there in the world. Amen. You gotta remember that. And they can't take us out of his hands. That's right. He can't snatch us out of his hands or separate us from his love. Now, the scripture also tells us that as believers, we're more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. Okay? You gotta remember that. We're not we're not just victorious, we're not just conquerors, we're more than conquerors. 
You know, you'd think conquering is a word that would say that's that's good enough. <laughs> you know, if you conquer, you're you got it. You're on top. You won. But we're more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. And another sort of a cliche that people say, but it has great value and truth in it, is simply this. You and I, as Christians, have read the last book in the Bible. Yes. And we know how it all ends. We win. We win. That's right. That's right. We win. So that's good news. It's good news. And we need to remember that. Uh, because uh, it's awfully easy when the devil just slams you up the side of the head when you're not expecting it. It's awfully easy to just get down all of a sudden and forget everything that we should be remembering about where we are. You know, we, we just... We can just get down and out all of a sudden before we think. And um, and we need to just keep it in the forefront. Uh, remind ourselves daily, greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. Now, verse 19. He says, for who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Now, is it not even you? It's stated sort of strange, isn't it? It's even more strange in the Greek. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at His coming? Now, this is taking us into that some of that stuff I was talking about earlier about the the teachings in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians about the coming of Jesus. Here Paul asks a question. Who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Now that's what the New American Standard translates. The Revised Standard and the New Living Translation puts it this way, along with the uh, interlinear Greek English New Testament. It says, for what is our hope? Instead of who is our hope, what is our hope? And I believe by the Greek that's a little better uh, uh, translation of it. For what is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Hope here is to be understood as source of hope. Uh, joy is to be understood as uh, cause of joy. And I think that's why the question uh, of what instead of who uh, should be a better translation because of the, the meaning of those two words. Now, <clears throat> this crown of exaltation, the way it is translated in some translations, literally is crown of boasting. Crown of boasting. Okay? Uh, and that's interesting because we, we, we might have to think sometimes about, well, we shouldn't boast. Another word might be pride. We shouldn't feel pride or be prideful. But this is crown of boasting. Now I want you to notice when it's going to be okay and when you're going to have a crown of boasting. Maybe you shouldn't boast as a Christian now. Maybe you shouldn't have pride as a Christian now. Now some, some forms of pride are good, okay? But most forms of pride are, are, are not acceptable uh, for us. It can be sin, really. But there's a time in which we're going to get a crown of boasting and it's going to be okay to boast. Okay? So keep that in mind. We'll see that in a minute. This crown here referred to the laurel wreath that was given to the, the, the victor in the uh, uh, athletic games of Paul's day. And you get this, this, you know, like we think of getting a gold medal or whatever. They got a, a laurel wreath. Uh, and I'm they, sure they probably put it around their neck or something like the gold medal. I'm not certain of that, probably. <clears throat> so Paul's hope, his joy, or his crown of boasting, he, he's saying here, is it not you? And uh, what that is, is simply meaning is uh, it's the Thessalonican believers. 
he's asking it in a in a question form, but it's it's like rhetorical. It's it's it is them. Is it not you? It is the Thessalonican believers that will be his crown of joy, boasting, and and all of that nature. Now, when will Paul's hope? joy or crown of boasting be it will be in the presence of our lord jesus at his coming that's what he's saying here now the greek word translated presence means uh before or in front of so there's this picture that you're going to be before or in front of jesus okay um so when specifically then is this going to happen it is uh, referred to here, it is at his coming. Now, the Greek word translated coming here is the word parousia, okay? And it refers to his presence, okay? At his presence. Now, this is not the coming of Jesus to deliver the worldwide judgment at the end of the tribulation. But this is the coming of Jesus at the rapture. Now, it's, it's important to realize that there are times in the New Testament in which the return of Jesus, when it's spoken of in Scripture, is referring to what we would think of as his, his, the second phase of his second coming, which is his coming at the end, when he comes down with us who have been raptured up to heaven already. He comes down with us at the, the end of the tribulation. And he brings an end to all the events. The, the greatest group of armies that have ever been uh, brought together in the history of the world. The greatest uh, amount of firepower that the world has ever known. And they're all there ready to destroy Israel once and for all to take them off the map. Uh, just like the Palestinians would love to do now and the Arabs would love to do now. Uh, he's going to bring an end to all of that. He's going to destroy all of those armies. And he's going to bring an end to it. And then he's going to usher us a, a short while after that into the thousand-year kingdom. But that's not the time in this aspect of the return. Other times you will read of the return of Jesus, and that's what it's referring to. But this is referring to what we would call the first phase of the return of Christ, which is the rapture of the church. In that second phase, when he comes, the world will see him. Everyone that's alive will see him. Those armies will see him when he comes. He will come down with us who have been in heaven with him for the last seven years. Okay? And we will come down with him and we will see him bring that destruction and the end of all of those armies. Um, and uh, that will be a, a great event. But this is when he comes in the clouds of the heavens. And the world, the lost world, is not going to see him. What's going to happen is all the Christians are going to be taken up. And, uh, and all of a sudden, the world is going to be amazed. Because all of these Christians have... have have disappeared. Now, uh, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of people that's going to be rejoicing because many people today believe uh, that the problem with the world today is the Christians and the Jews. That's the problem with the world. And if all the Christians and the Jews were gone, this, this uh, uh, new age could be ushered in that would make everything wonderful. Uh, and they're going to get their chance to find that out. If they want to reject Jesus and think that way, but I'm telling you, they're not going to like what they get. Because the greatest, most horrible conditions that the world has ever known is going to start taking place. Uh, when the church leaves and the Antichrist comes on the scene. Now it's not going to be as bad in the first three and a half years as it is the last three and a half. But if I read my scripture right, um, 
one third, correct me, correct me, uh, Kevin, if I'm wrong on this, one third of the population of the world will be destroyed in that first three and a half years. One third. We're talking now with the population that Jesus comes now. We're talking, we're talking a couple of billion people. Two and a half billion, not million, billion people. And, and that's only the, the first part. The great tribulation is the last three and a half years. That's when it really gets bad. That's when it, you separate the men from the boys. Okay? And that last half. But what we're talking about is the rapture, okay? So Paul is saying that when the rapture occurs, the Thessalonican believers will be his hope or joy or crown of boasting. That's when you can boast, okay? When he stands literally with those he has led to Christ and influenced in the Christian life, when he stands literally, and let's use that word now, face, face to face with Jesus. Face to face in front of Jesus. And he will be experiencing his crown of boasting for those that he had influenced in the Christian life. <clears throat> for they will be there with him. Now, I'm thankful for every person that God has ever allowed me to be used by His Spirit to have any influence on uh, for Christ. I, I wish there had been more. But I am thankful and I give Him honor and glory for every everyone that I've ever had any opportunity to, to influence uh, in a direction uh, for Christ. But when I think about what Paul is describing here, there is one person that stands out in my mind that all of them will be important. Every one of them will. But there's this one person that stands out in my mind that will be um, just a little bit more exciting than the others as I stand before Jesus and get the crown of boasting and those who I've been able to influence for Christ will be there with me and us in front of, face to face to, with Jesus. And uh, <clears throat> she's a lady that Belita probably already knows in who it is. No, she doesn't. I can look at her face and tell her. <laughs> uh, if I say Navajo lady, she'll know. <clears throat> a Navajo lady named Florence Blackhead. Um, Florence lived uh, at the base of Big Bell Mesa uh, on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. And uh, she lived down there in the winter. And in the summer, she uh, moved up to her summer camp up in the mountains where she carried all of her livestock up, uh, where it was cooler and where there was grass for them to eat because everything dried up down lower. And, uh, and she would carry them up uh, in the mountains uh, just above Big Bell Mesa, where she lived at the other part in the, in the, in the summer at the, at the foot of. So she was down in the lower part, and then there was the Big Bell Mesa, and then there was a road that went on up into the mountains above that. And uh, that's where she, she went for the, um, for the summer. And um, I met her on a cold, snowy winter day, 14 inches of fresh snow on the ground in January of 1982. And uh, the way the Lord led me to her house was because I was out there on the reservation. We had just moved there the first of that month. This was my first trip out on the reservation away from the reservation where we lived, okay? We, we were on the reservation, but it was a, 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 a small town there. But this was out on the reservation where I was going out to try to start Bible studies to hope to start more churches. And it was my first excursion out. I had said in my mind that I was going every Thursday. I woke up to 14 inches of snow and I said I'm going anyway. So I managed to get out there on the, the paved roads. And when I got off the paved roads, I was following a, a grader. And this grader was plowing snow. And so I could follow him. I just followed him. I didn't have a clue where I was going. 
I just followed him. And I followed him for quite a while. And finally, I looked off some distance to the left, and I saw a little two-room house and a hogan over there. And, and I thought, huh? A hogan. Two-room house and a hogan. Uh, that's an Indian house, okay? Made out of wood, dirt roof, all of that. Hole in the middle for the smoke to go out because they had a fire built in the, in the dirt floor inside. Uh, <clears throat> but I saw that and I thought, well, I'm going to go over there. <laughs> and uh, I could have run off in a hole, you know, <laughs> and never been found again. But it was a whiteout, really, literally. No, no markings of any kind. So I start out across the field going to that place and I make my way up to this, this house. And I knock on the door, <clears throat> and uh, and and this lady came to the door, and she was a very typical 62-year-old Navajo woman. Uh, she, uh, she her face was red because she was an Indian, but it was even more red because of all the years of just being out in the sun herding sheep, just day after day, just cooking her with the sun, and. Uh, but her eyes were bloodshot, just really bloodshot. And I, and I think they were bloodshot because she had been drinking. Uh, and uh, she had been drinking for a long time. And, and her eyes were bloodshot. And, uh, and so uh, another thing that I saw in her eyes, they were the saddest eyes I ever saw. Uh, not only were they bloodshot, but the way I would put it was like, that woman had the weight of the world on her shoulders. And I later learned some of the things that was so heavy upon her. Uh, but, but she was just so sad looking. And, um, and so she opens the door. I see her. She sees me. I can't speak a word of English. And... I don't think, I don't know that she spoke any, I mean, I couldn't speak a word of Navajo and she couldn't speak English. I don't know that she, I couldn't speak a word of English either. Uh, I, I think maybe she understood a few words of English, but I don't think she spoke very many. Uh, at least she didn't speak any of them that day. Uh, and like I said, I didn't speak any Navajo. But God really allowed us to communicate that day some way. And I think it was some way through our eye connection, okay? And and somehow, and I told her about Jesus. I'm sitting there talking and not knowing whether she understood or not, but I knew for sure she understood the name Jesus. So I knew she understood why I was there at least. And I somehow understood, I, I think I did, maybe I just read into it. But anyway, I thought I understood that, that she said I could come back to her house. And she didn't say that in words. But I left there with the thought, I'd go back and see this woman if I can find where she is. Okay? <laughs> because the next time I went back, there was probably no snow. Uh, but anyway, I went back again for a visit. And the next time I went, her, her son was there, her youngest son, and he was probably... Uh, late 20s or early 30s probably... Uh, and uh, he interpreted for us and uh, she got saved that day and uh, and so she said we could start having a Bible study and out of her hope out of her hogan she wasn't living in it uh, she was in the little two room house and um, two rooms instead of one uh, <clears throat> moved up in the world uh, but uh, but uh, she said we could have the Bible studies there. So we started having Bible studies there. And uh, then we bought an army tent. And uh, we were going to meet there and give us more room. And uh, her son was told, when it snows, clean the tent off them so it don't cave in. Well, one night the snow came too heavy and caved the tent in. So we had to go back to the Hogan. But I would go up to the summer camps with her in the summer. And, and sometimes belated, the kids would go up with me. And, um, and we went up there one day. I, I just got to tell you this story. It's, 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 it's a really good story. Uh, we went up there, and we had our two little kids. One was four and one was six. And, uh, and we went up. And, and her summer camp was more primitive 
then her dirt floor, no running water, no electricity, Hogan down below. It really was, if you can imagine that. It was just, it, it was just, just poles thrown up on top and around the side of other poles. And, um, and of course she cooked with an open fire and so she was going to prepare food for us that day. And I love the way she did it. And uh, <clears throat> she had the open fire there. And first she made coffee. She had some coffee, uh, water, and she just took a handful of coffee and just, I like the way she just threw it into the pot. <laughs> I mean, she knew just how much of a handful to get and throw it in. And she set that over by the fire. And then she's going to fix us dinner, lunch, lunch. And so she gets her skillet out. She's got her fire all hot. And, and she gets this, this spoon, I'd call it. It was huge. It was as big as my hand. And she scooped it down in a thing of lard, real lard. And it was piled like this. And she put that in the skillet and put it on the fire. <laughs> And then she started cutting up some potatoes. And then she opened a can of Spam <laughs> and started cutting the Spam. And so she puts the Spam and the potatoes at the same time in the skillet with the lard that's now liquid and bubbling, okay? It's, it's the right temperature. And that cooks really quick and she puts that over to the side. And then she puts another scoop of lard in. If I ever have a heart attack, it'll be back for that day. <laughs> another scoop of lard in and puts the skillet back down there. And then she gets her dough out and she starts working it. And she makes it into a thing about this size, just really, really thin. And, and it's fry bread when it's finished. And she put that in the skillet and let it get crisp on one side and then flipped it and crisp on the other side and took that out. That's what we had to eat. And I'm here to tell you that was about as good a meal as I ever had in my whole life. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to. Now, this is, this you're going to love this part. She had a long stick, just about the length of Paul's stick there, only didn't have a curve on the end. Okay? And on the end of that stick, she had some baling wire with a fork wrapped around the end of that stick. Now, the reason she had that was so she could flip the fry, fry bread and stir anything else in the skillet without getting down there closer to the heat of the fire. And so she'd get that fry bread just right. She'd reach down in there and flip it over, let that other side get right, flip it out, and then put another piece in. But I, I really, seriously, I, the atmosphere made me, I, I was just loving it all, you know. But, um, but the food was good. It was really good. And, um, and that lady just loved our kids. She just loved to touch their hair. And, and she just thought they were wonderful. But uh, she died while we were on the reservation. But... Um, there you go but 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 when, when i think about people that i look forward to seeing in heaven i look forward to seeing that woman because i never saw her ever again with sad eyes <laughs> She was totally, totally transformed. And, uh, yes, yes. And, um, she went to Albuquerque one time. And she must have been in some used furniture store. And she saw three chairs that were made welded together. And she bought those three chairs, which probably she couldn't afford. And she brought those three chairs back to use in that church in the Hogan. 
I guess she thought the preacher and whoever else should say that. Um, but praise God for what that woman was involved in, allowing that church to start and allowing us to continue to come out there and, and preach and, and all. There is a Baptist church right now meeting in a place called Sonoste, New Mexico because of that woman. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that there are probably people coming to your mind right now that you have sought to have influence in for Jesus. And I want you to be looking forward to them being your hope, your joy, and your crown of boasting as you stand in front of the Lord Jesus at His coming and as you stand there alongside of them. That's going to be a great day. And I want to encourage us over the next few months during this ride season, let's get out there and let's be like the song we were singing. Let's be that light in the darkness. Uh, let's get out there among the bikers. Let's get out there among the uh, RV people. Let's get out there among the uh, hot rodders. Let's get out there among the campers. Uh, let's get out there among the hunters, the, the, the fishermen, uh, bicycle riders. Well, we're probably all too old to do that. Uh, the joggers, well, we're all too old to do that too. The people that are walking, get out there among them. The shoppers, whatever it is you get out there and do in the world. Okay? Because every one of us gets out there somewhere. Okay? Get out there among all of those people that get out of prison, that are picked up by somebody that's blessing them in the name of Jesus. Ah, how incredible that is. What am I leaving out? I don't know any other ways I can think of. But get out there with them and let your light shine. And let's do whatever God will let us do to, to influence them in seeing them come into the kingdom of God. And it doesn't matter whether we get to see it happen or not. Some are going to plant, some are going to water, and some are going to harvest. Okay? And it really doesn't matter which aspect you and I are involved in. <laughs> the pay is the same. <laughs> the pay is the same. We're going to get to stand with our crown of boasting even if we just planted seed or watered. The person that harvested don't get it all. We all share equally. So let's get out there and do it. And I'm going to close with verse 20 just very quickly. I've run on too much with too many stories. For you are our glory and joy. Paul closes this verse indicating that the Thessalonican believers are their glory and joy. Glory is the English translation of a Greek word that means some strange words here. Reputation. We probably wouldn't think about that. Credit, honor, glory, or as one translation says, pride. Joy refers to their personal feelings and delight. The Thessalonican believers then will be Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy's reputation, credit, honor, glory, and pride that will produce personal feelings of delight as they stand together before Jesus when He comes after rapturing His church. Those whom you and I have influenced for Christ will be our glory, pride, and joy on that day when we have all those personal feelings of delight as we stand before Jesus who has just raptured us up into His presence in the heaven. Now, I don't know how it's all going to happen you know, it, it, it's going to be a big production getting us all with our group standing before Jesus. But I'm sure He's got the power to do it. And he's got it figured out. And we don't have to worry about figuring it out, okay? But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. 
and uh, and it's going to be a great day, and we're we're looking forward to that. Now, if uh, let me ask a couple of questions, and we'll close. Are you faithfully spending time together with other believers in the fellowship of, and ministry of a local church? I think most everybody here can answer yes to that. If you're not, then I would encourage you to do what's necessary to be able to answer that yes. Are you aware of the reality of the power of the enemy at, uh, at work against you? And... Uh, I believe most of us would have to say yes to that. And I want to say it this way. If you have a yes answer, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Okay? <clears throat> because it means you're counting for Jesus. It means you're a believer. And when you become a believer, you get a target on you. Okay? You get a target on your back. And that's the way it should be. Okay? So if you're experiencing the enemy hitting you at various times in your life, then that's a good thing. Okay? Learn from it. Uh, find out what God, why God's allowing it to happen so you can find out what He's wanting you to know. Okay? What He's wanting you to teach you. What He's wanting you to, to equip you with. And then let it be a positive thing. Are you aware of the power of the Holy Spirit that overcomes the power of the enemy in your life? Amen. And, and hopefully we're all realizing that, but we need to realize it more. We all need more of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And we will from the, now to the time we're finished here on this earth. But uh, that's also a good thing. So rejoice in that. And then... Are there those you have influenced for Christ who will be your hope or joy or crown of boasting before Jesus at the rapture? And if so, rejoice. Be thankful. Look forward to that. But let's commit ourselves to seeking to reach more. Okay? And, um, and the way you're going to do that is be who you are using what God has gifted you with. Your time, your talents, your money, your spiritual mm -hmm. gift. You don't have to do somebody else's ministry. You don't have to measure up to somebody else's ministry. All you have to do is be who God made you. Be who you are accountable for. And go out there and be you. If it's at the drag strip, if it's at the horse show, Wherever else you show up. The mall. Wherever. Okay? Be who you are. And God will use that. And people's lives will be changed. If you need to accept Christ today, we invite you to do that. If you're a Christian that needs to recommit your life to Christ, we invite you to do that. And if you need prayer for any reason, we invite you to get prayer. Our ministry team will be to my right, your left of the room as we close. Go let them pray with you. They're ready, anxious, willing, empowered, excited about the thoughts of praying for you. So go back and, and, and let them be a blessing to you. Uh, our offering bucket is to the left of the doors as usual. If you'd like to participate in the ministry of our church, then drop in your tithes and offerings and uh, we'll be able to uh, do that work together. And thank you for doing so. Thank you for being here today. Remember, ride 12 o'clock out back, ride and drive. I uh, hope you can join us. God bless you. You're dismissed.